Thank you so much. It's Thank you. Thank you, Eduardo, for that wonderful introduction, and more importantly, the incredible work that you do here. Eduardo quickly brought me over to the Princeton University Art Museum, and I recommend to everyone to go to see this exhibit, the, itinerancy, the itinerant languages of photography. Now, we race through it, as um, I'm ashamed to say, uh, rather than dwelling on every picture. Um, but there were two quotes uh, in the exhibit that I think very much also capture what we try to do at Democracy Now! You walk into the exhibit and Susan Sonstag says, to collect photographs is to collect the world. And Laszlo Moholy Naj says, the illiteracy of the future will be ignorance, not of reading or writing, but of photography. At Democracy Now!, our daily grassroots global news hour that airs on 1,200 public radio and television stations around the country and around the world, we try to capture these moments in a different way whether it is the visual images or people's voices. In a voice, you can hear the world. You can hear generations. You can hear centuries. And think, contrast that to what we get in the mainstream media. That small circle of pundits who know so little about so much, explaining the world to us and getting it so wrong. The remarkable voice of the majority of people in this country and around the world must be heard in the media today, which is why we need independent media. My colleague Dennis Moynihan and I, our latest book is called The Silenced Majority. And the reason we call it that is because I really do think that those who are deeply concerned about peace and justice in the world, those who are opposed to war, those who are concerned about global warming, about corporate control, about issues of privacy, are not a fringe minority, not even a silent majority, but the silenced majority, silenced by the corporate media, which is why we have to take it back. It really is, I believe, a matter of life and death. I think the media can be the greatest force for peace on earth. Instead, it's wielded as a weapon of war, and that has to be changed. I come originally from Pacifica Radio. How many of you are familiar with Pacifica? Well, it was founded almost 65 years ago in Berkeley, California by a man named Lou Hill who was a war resistor when he came out of the detention camps he said, there's got to be a media outlet that is not run by corporations that profit from war, but run by journalists and artists. And that's how Pacifica was born. As George Gerb Gerbner, the former dean at the Annenberg School of Communications, University of Pennsylvania, would say, not run by corporations that have nothing to tell and everything to sell that are raising our children today. And so the first Pacifica station was KPFA in Berkeley, 1949. 1959, KPFK in Los Angeles. 1960, my station in New York, uh, WBAI. 1970, KPFT went on the air in Houston and WPFW in 1977. Those are the five Pacifica stations. So today, as we broadcast all over the world in the morning, I then one by one went on a few of the stations to raise money because we don't turn to corporations. We don't make backroom deals with the weapons manufacturers when we're covering war to bring us, to bring you that coverage. When we're covering climate change, we don't turn to the oil, the gas, the coal companies, except to ask them to be guests on the show, to bring out the information they have, but not to ask them for financial support to convey to you their, um, what they want to convey. 
when we are covering the health care debate in this country, such a critical issue. We don't turn to the insurance industry and big pharma, the drug companies, to ask them to pay for the coverage. We turn to you, the listeners, the viewers, the readers, and say, if you're committed to independent media, please give what you can. So I was doing that today on KPFT in Houston, a fascinating station, went on the air 36 years ago in 1970. In fact, it was this weekend that was a kind of special anniversary for KPFT. It went on the air in the spring of 1970, just a few weeks into its broadcasts in the Petro Metro of Houston. The station was blown up. Uh, the Ku Klux Klan strapped dynamite to the base of the transmitter, and they blew it to smithereens. When they got back on their feet, I mean, it, there was a silver lining to this because, you know, it's not as Pacific had money for advertising to let people know about this new station. So it certainly blew it into the consciousness of a potential listening audience in Houston. But they got back on their feet, they re rebuilt their transmitter, and the Klan strapped dynamite to the base of the transmitter again. And right in the middle of Alice's restaurant, the song being sung, the station was blown up for the second time this past weekend, 36 years ago. Now, I don't remember if it was the Grand Dragon or the Exalted Cyclops, because I often confuse their titles, but he said it was his proudest act. I think that's because he understood how dangerous Pacifica is, how dangerous independent media is, Dangerous because it allows people to speak for themselves. And when you hear someone speaking from their own experience, whether it is a Palestinian child or an Israeli grandmother, an uncle in Afghanistan or an aunt in Iraq, you start to understand where they're coming from. Now, I didn't say you have to agree with what you hear, but it's a chance to begin to find common ground. You could say that sounds like my baby or my bubba. And how often do you agree with your family members, right? You can fiercely disagree. But it makes it less likely that you would want to destroy them. I see the media as a huge kitchen table that stretches across the globe, that we all sit around and debate and discuss the most important issues of the day, war and peace, life and death, and anything less than that is a disservice to the service men and women of this country. Okay, they can't have these debates on military bases. They rely on us in civilian society to have the discussions that lead to the decisions about whether they live or die, whether they're sent to kill or be killed. Anything less than that is a disservice to a democratic society. You know, we have many soldiers, um, people in the military who listen to and watch Democracy Now! because we talk about war. There's no more serious decision a country can take than to go to war. And if you're going to do that, you can't backburner it. And if you don't backburner it in the media, I mean, much more likely your country will not go to war. Because I really do think most people understand what war is about. We were going to uh, Denver Airport a couple of months ago, and we got off the flight, and there were some soldiers holding up a sign for a general. They were having a general's meeting, and they were picking him up. And, and when we came by, they started to wave and smile. And I turned around. I thought the general was behind me. Um, but it wasn't the case. So I went over. I said, do you listen to or watch Democracy Now? And they said, every day, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> and I said, really? What do you like about it? It's objective, ma'am. You're talking about war. We all listen on the base. I mean, think about that. It's not about whether you're for war or against war, but you're showing the realities of war, the horrors of war. And they understand it more than anyone else in this country. They understand it maybe perhaps not as much as people who are at the target end of those guns, but we also feel it's critical to get those voices. We're not here to cheerlead for war. We're not there to circle our wagons around the president, like, for example, coverage of the Iraq War when the U.S. attacked in 2003. The media watch group FAIR did a study 
in the two weeks around General Powell, then Secretary of State, giving his push for war at the United Nations. That was February 5th, 2003. It was the final nail in the coffin for so many. It's a speech he would later say was a stain on his career. Because many saw General Powell, Secretary of State Powell, dragging his feet on the war. And for him to say the evidence was in that there were weapons of mass destruction convinced many. So this Media Watch Group Fair did a study in the two weeks around this speech. And they looked at the four major nightly newscasts, NBC Nightly News, CBS Evening News, ABC World News Tonight, and the PBS NewsHour. And they looked at those two weeks, how many interviews were done around war, 393 between all of them. How many, this is a time when about half the population was for the war and half against, about six weeks before the US invaded. How many of those 393 interviews were with peace leaders? About half the 393 sort of reflect how people are feeling. Maybe a tenth, hardly, three. Three of almost 400 quotes in the four major nightly networks. And why did this matter? It's less, they have less power now, but still very significant power because, as Noam Chomsky said, the media manufactures consent, manufactures consent for war. That's no longer a mainstream media. That's an extreme media beating the drums for war. I get questions in the media when I'm invited on the networks. You know, what do you think of the mainstream media? I say, I, I think it would be a good idea. <laughs> Reflect what the mainstream really thinks. You know, there was an incredible experience this summer. Lest you give up hope that those forces for peace will never prevail. Look what happened with Syria. I mean, Syria is a desperate situation. But I'm talking about the US, President Obama saying that the US would strike Syria. Why has that not happened to this point? President Obama was certainly headed with the former anti-war uh, Vietnam soldier, Kerry, now Secretary of State, headed to a military strike on Syria. What stopped him? You might say President Putin? Hardly. I think it was the people of this country. I mean, think about what happened. President Obama was about to strike, and they were going to do it unilaterally if they had to, but they did see it's probably a better idea to get some support of other countries. Didn't think they could get it from the United Nations, and so their trusty ally in war, Britain. But the Prime Minister Cameron said he'd got to get, he would have to get it approved through the Parliament. Interesting, at the time, President Obama wasn't saying that himself, have to get approval from Congress. But that is what Prime Minister Cameron said, and he was pretty sure he would get it, and so was President Obama, so he was moving forward, and Prime Minister Cameron went to the Parliament, and for the first time in 150 years, the Parliament said no to a Prime Minister wanting to wage war. This put President Obama in a very awkward position. He not only wasn't turning to his Congress, but he was now alone in saying he would strike Syria. Not exactly clear for what reasons, because he said he didn't want to strike out the regime, but that was another issue. And so he was forced to turn to his own Congress. And I mean, it just wasn't going to happen. I'm not saying he couldn't have twisted arms, but. It was the people who spoke to their politicians, their representatives, all over this country. Now, of course, the Republicans would be opposed to President Obama, so they would oppose the strike on Syria for the most part. So then he would have to turn to his allies, the Democrats, and he had a huge problem. I mean, first he had to have the Democrats support him in the whole scandal around spying with the NSA, and he was in the middle of that, of his own officials lying to Congress, like James Clapper, the National Intelligence Director, saying that the U.S. doesn't spy on Americans, but then Edward Snowden's documents revealing something very different, and this was putting a lot of Democrats in very awkward positions, because they would have been the ones speaking out against if it was President Bush revealing all this information, and now it was a Democratic president that was pushing for war and their districts were saying no. 
95% in, in many cases of districts, and that was an underestimate, were telling their politicians, I mean, we can't afford Head Start, we're losing our jobs, and we're now going to engage in yet another war in the Middle East. And, I mean, you look at networks like MSNBC that often expresses the president's position. They were in a very awkward position. And I remember looking at um, an interview. It was with Hakeem Jeffries. He's a Brooklyn Congress member. They kept saying, coming up an undecided politician. Normally, he would not have been undecided in any way if it was a Republican president. But then the commercial ended, and uh, Congress member Jeffries was on. And he said, I am in a very difficult position. My entire district is opposed to war. And yet my president is pushing for it. Underneath the lower third, those are the words at the bottom of the screen, it said, Hakeem Jeffries, in case you're watching on mute or you can't hear, Hakeem Jeffries, colon, why I support the strike on Syria. As he's saying exactly the opposite, and I'm so used to calling Dimash now, I was trying to think, well, what would be the number I'd call it, MSNBC? They have some, and this went on for about 10 minutes. As he was saying, I don't see how I can support this, it was saying why I support the strike on Syria. You know, maybe it was an intern who didn't get the memo, or maybe they did get the memo, who knows, um, over at MSNBC. And by the way, that is no comment on interns, because I think um, young people uh, being part of news organizations are absolutely critical to the lifeblood of what we do. And I encourage everyone, if you, by the way, want to intern at Democracy Now!, feel free. And my, uh, the interns of Democracy Now!, some are here. And I want to welcome Nakai and Emily and say thank you to Jamie for coming. It is absolutely critical that we build independent media with the next generation. But there you have one little example, Syria. So did President Putin of Russia, did he save us from Syria, from the striking Syria? Um, I hardly think that was really what motivated President Obama. Yes, the media credited Putin with extending a lifeline to President Obama, allowing him a diplomatic way to delay his planned attack. But without the mass domestic public outcry against a military strike, Obama would not have needed, nor would he likely have heeded an alternative to war. It is true President, Obama, President Putin extended a lifeline that he was able to then seize. And that's why we're in the position we are. But the situation in Syria must be resolved, and it must be resolved diplomatically. And we need a media that presents all of the different opinions instead of beating the drums for war. That's why places like Pacifica Radio, uh, independent websites are so critical and have to be supported more than ever. You know, we just passed a very important anniversary, September 11th. Um, when the September 11, 2001 attacks occurred, Democracy Now! was broadcasting from an old firehouse, a century-old firehouse just blocks from ground zero. We broadcast at the time at 9. Now we broadcast live at 8. Um, and the first plane hit the first tower at 8.47 in the morning. We didn't know what had happened. Uh, we were just about to go on the air. Um, oh, we have breaking news. It looks like a, a plane has crashed into the World Trade Center. There is a huge explosion and fire at the top of the World Trade Center. What? This is a live broadcast at 8.52 in the morning. We have no story right now as to the cause, if it's an accident or was intentional, but it looks like the top yeah. half of both towers are absolutely in flames. This is a huge disaster. Be careful. Stay out of the lower Manhattan area. We're going to get headlines on this story and be back as soon as we can with updates uh, again live at this moment an aircraft or something has exploded into the top floors of the World Trade Center causing a massive disaster 
situation. A lot we will, of smoke. A lot of smoke coming out of the tops Between of the building. Towers. This is live. We will come back to you in a moment. And uh, There is a huge building. gaping hole in the top. An airplane-shaped hole. An airplane-shaped hole, a gigantic hole in the side of one of the Twin, Pounds, uh, twin Tower buildings. Uh, it is burning. There's smoke coming out of it. It looks like a major disaster has occurred in downtown Manhattan. Apparently, there's paper flying all around outside of our windows right here at 120 Wall Street. Max Schmid just came in to say. Right. Yeah. So we can see it from it's here. Plenty of smoke, both towers. It's a major disaster, and you have to understand the World Trade Center just uh, seven years ago was the uh, target of a terrorist bombing attack that uh, injured and killed six people and injured a thousand. And uh, we don't know what is the nature of this, if it was just an accident or intentional, but it looks like a uh, disaster has occurred in lower Manhattan. This will be dominating our news throughout the whole world in the United States, I'm sure, today. And uh, stay tuned for Democracy Now! And I'm sorry, sad to report the uh, the disaster in Lower Manhattan, and I'm sure there's nobody a little was hurt. It's a no. major, major disaster exactly. right now. At least the people, the people who Be were careful. in the plane are, Avoid Lower yeah, Manhattan. Not with us anymore. Stay out of Lower Manhattan. We were doing a special that day on the connection between terror and September 11th, 1973 the day Salvador Allende died in the palace in Chile as the Pinochet forces rose to power. The U.S.-backed Pinochet forces, the Nixon-backed Pinochet forces, the Kissinger-backed Pinochet forces, the ITT-backed Pinochet forces. As Pinochet rose to power and over the next 17 years would kill thousands of Chileans and beyond the borders of Chile. Um, in Argentina, in the streets of Washington, D.C., you know, the murder on Embassy Row, it even extended here but didn't change U.S. policy. September 21st, 1976, the former Chilean ambassador to the United States, Orlando Letelier, died in his car with his assistant, Ronnie Moffat, from the Institute for Policy Studies when a car bomb exploded under their vehicle. Murder on Embassy Row, September 11th, 1973. September 11th was a horrific moment. And it's not the only time, as you can see, that September 11th was connected to terror. In Chile, September 11th, 1977, South Africa, Steve Biko was being beaten to death in the back of a van, the founder of the Black Consciousness Movement. The next morning, September 12th, he would die. Unfortunately, being beaten to death by apartheid forces backed by the United States. September 11th, 1990, Guatemalan anthropologist Myrna Mack was killed by Guatemalan security forces. Sadly, US-backed Guatemalan forces. September 11th, 19... September 11th, all of these days, it is critical to know that what happened in this country, in the United States, was a horrific moment. We'll never know how many people died on that day, 3,000 people incinerated in a moment. But we also have to understand what terror means all over the world which is why I was deeply disturbed on this past September 11th. And my colleague Dennis Moynihan and I wrote a column about it, Carrie Kissinger and the other September 11th. As President Obama's attack on Syria appeared to have been delayed for the moment, it was remarkable that Secretary of State John Kerry was meeting on September 11th with one of his predecessors, Henry Kissinger, reportedly to discuss strategy on forthcoming negotiations on Syria with Russian officials. The Kerry-Kissinger meeting and the public outcry against the proposed attack on Syria to which both men were publicly committed should be viewed through that other lens of September 11th, 1970. As Peter Kornbluh said on Democracy Now!, who wrote the Pinochet file, a declassified dossier on atrocity and accountability, he said that Kissinger pushed Nixon forward to as aggressive but covert a policy as possible to make Allende fail, to destabilize Allende's ability to govern, to create what Kissinger called a coup climate. 
So we had on Democracy Now! because there was a remarkable gathering in New York on the 40th anniversary of the coup this past September 11th, the coup in Chile. We had on Juan Garces. Juan Garces is a Spanish lawyer who together worked with the great Spanish judge, Baltasar Garzón, to have, Ayen, to have Pinochet indicted decades later when he was visiting Britain, held there for a year before he was sent back to face charges in Chile. We had Juan Garces on. Juan Garces was President Allende's closest advisor. Right, President Allende, the first democratically elected leader, uh, the democratically elected leader in Chile who died in the palace September 11th as Pinochet bombed the palace. He walked his advisor, Juan Garces, to the door of the palace before he died and said, you must go out and tell the world what has happened and what was our plan for this country. And Juan Garces has done that to this day, leading the charge to hold Pinochet responsible. When I asked him to describe that remarkable day, to share his experiences, he immediately talked not about 40 years ago. It wasn't what he was most interested in. He was most disturbed by what's happening right now. And Garces said on Democracy Now!, he talked about the alarming similarities between repression in Chile and U.S. policies today. He said, you have extraordinary renditions, you have extrajudicial killings, you have secret centers of detention. I'm very concerned that those methods were applied in Chile with the knowledge and the backing of the Nixon-Kissinger administration in this period. The same methods are being applied now in many countries with the backing of the United States. That is very dangerous for everyone, he said. I really do think that rather than meeting with Kissinger for advice, John Kerry would better serve the cause of peace by consulting with those like Garces who've spent their lives pursuing peace. The only reason Henry Kissinger should be pursued is to be held accountable like Pinochet in a court of law. Yes, we have to have a uniform standard of justice to be taken seriously, and to truly be a model of law and order and justice in the world. And that includes holding Henry Kissinger accountable, even to this day, as a model to the rest of the world. Yes, that day was absolutely critical, and we should know about it and talk about it to future generations 40 years ago, September 11, 2001 as well. You know, as we broadcast that day and then stayed in the firehouse for the coming days because the police had surrounded the area, we were below the evacuation zone, and we knew that in order to keep broadcasting, we would have to stay uh, below the line, right next to the World Trade Center. And I felt it was absolutely critical to bring out other voices because as thousands were gathering in parks in New York City and comforting each other and lighting candles, there was a very different image that was being projected to the rest of the world, a kind of blood-curdling scream for revenge, which was not the case in New York. I think about this sticker that went up all over um, in New York, our grief is not a cry for war, and how important it was to be able to reflect those voices as well. Like Rita Lasar, who lost her brother, Abe Zalmanowitz, on the 27th floor of the World Trade Center. He could have rushed out when the tower was hit, but he was next to his best friend, who was a paraplegic, and he was waiting for the uh, assistance to be able to bring him down, and he died with so many thousands of others. And as Rita looked for her brother and did that DNA race from hospital to hospital to see if she could find his remains, she realized in the days that followed the example that her brother was being used as when President Bush at the time gave a speech in the National Cathedral and invoked Abe Zalmanowitz's story and called him a hero. And she wrote a letter to the New York Times that actually was published as she saw that an attack would be imminent in Afghanistan, she said it would not lessen her pain 
to know that a woman in Afghanistan would soon lose her brother. She said, not in my brother's name, not in my name. Or Orlando and Phyllis Rodriguez, who lost their son, Ernesto Rodriguez, above the hundredth floor of the World Trade Center. He worked for Cantor Fitzgerald, and so many hundreds of those workers died. They didn't write a letter to the paper, but they wrote a letter online that swirled everywhere and said that even as they knew the worst grief of their lives, they said, not in our name, not in our son's name should you wage war. And it started this movement, September 11th Families for Peaceful Tomorrows. And we need a media that expresses those voices, how important they are. And not only individual voices, but voices of movements that fight for justice. What are some of those voices? Where are they around the world? You think about the remarkable moments, for example, of 2011, the time of the beginning of the Arab Spring, the time of Occupy Wall Street, uh, the time of the protest around the White House to stop the Keystone XL pipeline, one of the largest mass arrests in U.S. history, over 1,200 people. The har media hardly paid attention in August, September of 2011, but they certainly did when some of those came up to New York, and then they joined thousands as they marched on Wall Street. And to those who think Occupy Wall Street had no effect, I really think you have to have a much longer picture of how movements coalesce, how they change, how they inspire, how they ignite. Yes, September of 2011, September 17th, when people marched on Zuccotti Park carrying all sorts of signs, and the corporate media, first of all, didn't pay attention for about a week, even though it was right outside their windows. And they said the weakness of the movement was all the different messages everyone had, but I actually think it was the opposite. It was that all of these different movements were expressing a kind of communal frustration that we're continuing to see simmer today. One of the, those threads were those who were deeply concerned about the execution of Troy Davis. Troy Davis, I don't know how many of you know his case, but as people marched on Zuccotti Park, they carried signs that said, I am Troy Davis. After covering Zuccotti Park, September 17th, 18th, 19th, 20th, we flew directly down to Atlanta, Georgia, because this man, who had spent more than half his life on death row, was slated to die. There had been three death warrants issued against him. Each time, the execution was stopped just before he was killed, and this was the fourth, and we didn't know what would happen, but this is a man who professed his innocence throughout his incarceration. And his family hoped right to the end he was convicted of killing an off-duty police officer who had come to the aid of a homeless man who was being pistol-whipped. He was a hero cop, no question, the police officer that was killed. But the question was, who killed this police officer? And Troy Davis continually said it was not him. In fact, seven of the nine non-police witnesses at his trial would recant their testimony, saying that they had given a different testimony because of pressure from police. And so we went down to cover this execution. And a 1,000 people marched on the prison, the death row prison in Georgia, to try to bear witness and to hope that they would be there to celebrate a life, not a death. When we got to the prison, uh, we had hired a truck like CNN hires and all the big boys hire because in order to broadcast from the facility, there was no studio nearby. And the police and the um, prison guards said, no, you can't go near the protest pen they directed to put 150 people in and then others could be across the street. But I said, I'm not going to speak for six hours nonstop. We're here to broadcast the voices who come from all over the world. But they said, no, the press would be away from the people who had come to protest. Well, our van, our truck, our satellite truck was late as we were about to do this broadcast. And when they finally came, all the other trucks were lined up following the uh, directions of the prison guards. Our truck pulled up and the drivers, the cameramen, were larger than the prison guards. And when they came on the property, 
They said, where do you want the truck? I said, well, the prison guards are saying, they said, we're asking you where you want the truck. I said, well, I was thinking right over there where that protest pen is, where the family of Troy Davis, and they just barreled that truck over to the protest pen. And as they got out and the prison guards saw, well, their heft, everything was taken care of, and they handed me the microphone, the camera people, and they said, begin your broadcast. And so we did. Martina Correa, the sister of Troy Davis, who was battling cancer herself, but for 10 years carried the torch not only for her brother to remain alive, but against the death penalty in this country. She was there in a wheelchair. She would die a few weeks later. And other members of his family and hundreds of supporters, students from Morehouse and Spelman had come from Atlanta to bear witness and hold candles. And for a moment, it looked like, for just a moment, about 7 o'clock in the evening, once again there had been a stay. And there was a roar that went up everywhere. But then it became clear the Supreme Court was just taking one last look. But their point person would be Supreme Court Justice Clarence Thomas. The crowd waited several hours. The designated time was seven, but it went to eight and went to nine o'clock. And then we got the news that Troy Davis would be executed. It was about 1045 as he was laid out in that what has become in this country a kind of execution protocol, a ritual laid out on a cross-like gurney, his hands strapped down, his legs strapped down. And then the curtains open, and those who were brought in to witness the execution are there. It was the family members of Mark McPhail, the police officer. It was several of Troy Davis's lawyers and a friend And it was the press who came to mark his last words. Outside, we continued our broadcast, and the prison spokesperson came out and said, at something like 1108, Troy Anthony Davis is dead. They took his body by ambulance to Atlanta for the autopsy. His family would be charged for the transportation. And then the reporters came out and they recited the last words of Troy Anthony Davis. They said, as he lay there, he looked to the family of Mark McFell and said, I'm not the man who killed your father, your brother, your husband, and you should continue to pursue the truth. To his supporters, he said, please carry on the fight. And then he turned to his executioners and said, God have mercy on your soul. God bless your souls. That is part of what fueled Occupy Wall Street and the movements in this country deeply concerned about inequality and who gets put on death row and who has money and who doesn't. It's important to document all of these movements. As we stood on the grounds about quarter to midnight continuing our broadcast after the execution, the police guards, the prison guards came over to the truck and they threatened to pull the plug on our broadcast. And as I I could only think as we finished this five-hour broadcast and looked at the prison guards of the words of Mahatma Gandhi, who when asked what he thought of Western civilization said, He thought it would be a good idea. And so this week, I've just come from New Orleans with my colleagues at Democracy Now! We went down to New Orleans to cover the case of another man. His name is Herman Wallace. How many of you know who Herman Wallace is? Herman Wallace was a prisoner in Louisiana who spent more time in solitary confinement than any prisoner in the United States. Up until last week, it was almost 42 years in solitary confinement, most of that time consecutively. Who was Herman Wallace? He was a man who'd committed a robbery in the 1960s, and in prison, with another man named Albert Woodfox and another named Robert King. They formed a 
prison chapter of the Black Panther Party because they were at Angola Prison, named for the country in Africa where Africans were brought and enslaved in this country. It was a plantation and then a plantation prison. The images of Angola prison have been famous for decades with white prison guards on horseback with shotguns overseeing thousands of black prisoners picking cotton, believe it or not. And they were protesting the conditions of the prison. So they formed the chapter of the Black Panther Party. Herman Wallace never said he didn't commit the robbery and he should have served time for that. But what he said he didn't do is what happened next, and that was kill a prison guard. There was no evidence that connected him and Albert Wood Fox, the other founder of the Black Panther Party at Angola. There was a bloody fingerprint, but it was not Albert's or Herman's. But they were charged and convicted with the murder. Even the widow of the prison guard, Teeny Verrett, said, I do not believe these men had anything to do with the murder of my husband. But they were then thrown in prison, in the hole, rather. They were already in prison. Albert Wood Fox is there to this day. Yes, sometimes moved from one prison to another, but in solitary confinement. Herman Wallace, until last week, professed his innocence. Solitary confinement for almost 42 years. What happened last week? Well, we did our broadcast from New Orleans, and one of the people we had on our broadcast was Robert King. He was released after 29 years when a judge overturned his conviction. We talked about Herman Wallace. He was dying of advanced liver cancer. And on Tuesday, after our broadcast, Robert King and Albert Woodfox, Albert Woodfox still in prison, but allowed those shackled to say goodbye to Herman Wallace, who was dying of liver cancer. As Robert King came to the prison hospital to say goodbye, he got the news that a judge, a federal judge in Louisiana, had overturned the conviction of Herman Wallace. And it was the other two, they're known as the Angola Three, who delivered the news to a dying Wallace, Albert Wood Fox with him in shackles, that his conviction had been overturned. The judge in the case Judge Brian A. Jackson of the U.S. District Court for the Middle District of Louisiana demanded his release. As Robert King and Albert Woodfox left his side, knowing it would be the last time they would see Herman Wallace, Albert bent over, fully shackled, and kissed his forehead and said, you will be free soon, Herman. You will be free. The prison warden said he was going out to dinner. He would not be releasing Herman that day. And the judge said, no way. The judge demanded that the warden release Herman Wallace last Tuesday. When the prison warden said no, he said he would hold him in contempt. And so Herman's family and supporters and lawyers sent an ambulance to the prison and they carried Herman Wallace into this ambulance. He was taken to New Orleans where he grew up, to the house of one of his dearest friends. And it was there, two days later, he would die a free man. We have to not only look outside of ourselves, at other countries. We have to look at ourselves because whatever your position on the death penalty or war, we have to take responsibility for what our government represents. That's why we need an honest and open media that shows us the pictures, that shows us the images. 
I often talk about the story of Rosa Parks. Why Rosa Parks? It's one story that the media tells accurately. But actually, it doesn't. Because here was this woman, Rosa Parks, who on December 1st, 1955, sits down on the bus in Montgomery, Alabama. We know that part of it. She refuses to get up for a white passenger. And she launches the modern day civil rights movement. She actually helps to launch Dr. Martin Luther King. You know, we just saw the 50th anniversary of the march on Washington. It was Rosa Parks through her bravery that led to this young minister who just come into Montgomery being elected to be the spokesperson for the Montgomery Improvement Association that would lead to the desegregation of the transportation system for Montgomery. Now, that all is pretty much told. Um, but what the media gets wrong, well, I remember it very well. It was a few years ago when Rosa Parks died, and our Democracy Now! team raced to Washington because she was the first African-American woman to lay in state in the Capitol Rotunda. And then her body was brought to a Washington church, and we raced there. Thousands of people came out. Oprah was inside. Cicely Tyson was inside. They had erected loudspeakers so thousands could hear outside, and we were outside where it's often more interesting to be. And I was asking people, why are you here? And one young woman, she was a college freshman, she said she'd emailed her professors that morning to say, I won't be in class today, I'm going to get an education. <laughs> And what was it that the media got wrong? I remember CNN explicitly saying that day, Rosa Parks was a tired seamstress. She was no troublemaker. That's what they got wrong. Rosa Parks was a first-class troublemaker. She knew exactly what she was doing. And this is where the media demobilizes. This is what the media doesn't let us know. What is organizing all about? Yeah, Rosa Parks was tired seamstress, and she was also tired of what was going on, and she had been fighting it for years. She was the secretary of the local NAACP in Montgomery. She worked under E.D. Nixon. He came out of radical labor politics. He was the president of the chapter of the NAACP. He worked with A. Philip Randolph, the greatest organizer of the 20th century. Who would, he worked with him organizing the Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porters, the thousands of car porters on, of the, on the trains that would would go north to south. In fact, when they would go south from the north, they would take black newspapers um, um, like the Chicago Defender and they would throw them out the window of the trains as they went south. They were often slaves, had been enslaved themselves or were the children or grandchildren of slaves. Thousands of them. They were all called George. Not that their mothers named them George, but they were named for George Pullman, right? The names of the tra trains, which shows you why they needed to be organized. And A. Philip Randolph helped organize them. An interesting side story is A. Philip Randolph, Harry Belafonte told me this story, interestingly enough, and he was good friends with Eleanor Roosevelt. Imagine her saying that, oh, my friend Eleanor Roosevelt. But he said that Eleanor Roosevelt told him this story, and it was a story of her bringing A. Philip Randolph to meet with with FDR. And A. Philip Randolph held forth. He told FDR about the condition of working people in this country, about the condition of black people in this country. And FDR was quiet and after a while said, I don't disagree with anything you've said, but you're going to have to make me do it. As A. Philip Randolph laid out their demands, you'll have to make me do it. And interestingly enough, when President Obama was first running for president and he was here in New Jersey and he was in the backyard of someone's home, supporters, and he was taking questions and about to leave, and someone raised their hand in the back of the backyard and said, Senator Obama, what are you going to do about the Middle East? And he recounted the story of A. Philip Randolph meeting with FDR and he said, make me do it. Make me do it. It's very interesting. You know, President Obama was a community organizer. But what happens when the community organizer in chief becomes the commander in chief? Who does the community organizing then? 
And I think very much when you look at everything from extraordinary rendition to the fact that Guantanamo hasn't been closed, to the fact that the war in Afghanistan continues, to the fact that we are seeing the largest number of mass deportations in this country, or the largest number of deportations than any president in U.S. history. I think the number under President Obama is about to hit 2 million, which is a horrid milestone, as my colleague Juan Gonzalez at Democracy Now! just wrote a column about. How are all these things happening under the president who was this remarkable community organizer? I think when Senator Obama became President Obama, people had worked so hard to make him president. People were tired, but also they saw the right-wing backlash, the racist othering backlash where, you know, you'd say this man couldn't have born, been born in the United States making him other. And they didn't want to contribute to that in any way to criticize or weaken President Obama. But a community organizer knows, and he certainly knows. I mean, what happens when he's sitting in the Oval Office and those who are used to having the ear of the most powerful person on earth are whispering their demands in his ear? If he can't point out the window of the Oval Office and say, if I do that, they will storm the Bastille. If there's no one out there, he's in big trouble. You know, I think that for years people thought they were hitting their head against a brick wall, and that wall became a door. The door opened a crack. The question is, will that door be kicked open or slammed shut? And that's not up to him. Yes, he's the most powerful person on earth, but there is a force more powerful, and it's people all over this country banding together to make their demands. And so back to Rosa Parks, who had worked with E.D. Nixon, who worked with A. Philip Randolph in organizing that mo- the Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porters, A. Philip Randolph going on with Bayard Rustin to organize the 1963 march on Washington, where, President, where Dr. King gave his famous I Have a Dream speech. These are the people behind the scenes who do the organizing that it's critical to tell their stories to hear their voices, to understand how change happens, how much time it takes, and how much commitment it takes. But so Rosa Parks had been organizing for years with E.D. Nixon. In fact, she'd sat down on the bus before and refused to get up. In fact, other young women had sat down on the bus and refused to get up. You never know when that magic moment will come. But if you're engaged in social change. You will help to lay a foundation that when it does, well, you will help to determine the future. You will make history. And to show how incredibly brave Rosa Parks was, just go back a few months before she sat down on that bus, what further enraged her, inspired her, made her stand or sit her ground. It's the story of Emmett Till. Emmett Till, the summer of 1955, a 14-year-old African-American boy, teenager, in Chicago. His mother, Mamie Till, wanted him out of the city for the summer and sent him to be with family in Money, Mississippi. He was asleep at night with his aunt and uncle and his cousins, and a white mob came, and they ripped him out of bed. They beat him, they tortured him, and he ended up in the bottom of the Tallahatchie River. They said he wolf-whistled at a white woman. When his body was sent back to Chicago in a closed casket, his mother said, I want the casket open for the wake and the funeral. She wanted the world to see the ravages of racism, the brutality of bigotry. Thousands streamed by Emmett's casket and saw his distended, mutilated head. And then... Jet Magazine and other black publications, they took photographs and they actually published those photographs. And they were seared into the history and consciousness of this country. Mamie Till had something very important to teach the press of today. Show the images, show the pictures, Could you imagine if for just one week we saw the ravages of war everywhere? 
If the top of every TV or radio newscast told a story of a person who was dying in Afghanistan, or if everyone's Facebook wall or every tweet or every email talked about a baby dead on the ground, perhaps from a drone strike in Yemen or in Pakistan, if every newspaper, every surviving newspaper, top of the fold, had a photograph of a baby dead on the ground and actually named her, and told her story, who her parents had been. For just one week, Americans are a compassionate people. They would say, no, war is not the answer to conflict in the 21st century. restaurant it's about Alice and the restaurant but Alice's restaurant